Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast coming up. We realized we were in such a sensitive area that we needed to escape and we needed to walk fast and get out of there because we were inching high. But the problem was, there's, you know, the China map says it's Qinghai, the Tibet map says I'm in Tibet. And so um, it was very sensitive and we had to evade the locals because we learned that the locals in their little white felt tents, their gurs, as amazing as they were and super hospitable, and I loved my time with them, we, we came to learn that we have to do our utmost to avoid them because they would sort of radio to the next gur, to the next gur, until eventually there was signal that they could call the police and the police would be on their way. It'd take them seven hours or so to get to us and they wouldn't rock upon our tent until three, four o'clock in the morning. Oh my word, that just sounds unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, and that's minus the bears, the wolves, the minus 20 degrees Celsius, the snow blizzards. My next guest is an adventurer and an extreme athlete. He has pursued some incredible expeditions over the years and has covered a wide range of trips. He recently made global news by becoming the first person to hike the entire length of the Yangtze River in China, a 4,000 mile journey that took him 352 days to complete. He faced bears, altitude, wolves, landslide, blizzards, you name it, to which he had to send 10 out of the 16 team members that joined him for short stints home. So he had to cover so much ground with all these obstacles in his way. Today on the podcast, we talk about that trip along with his first big expedition across Mongolia, where in the Gobi Desert, it was so isolated with no sound that he says you can actually hear your body function. So I am delighted to introduce Ash Dykes to the podcast. Good to be here, John. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on and I cannot thank you enough. I mean, some of the trips that you've done over the years have been absolutely incredible. Uh, we'll get into some of your absolutely epic trips from Mongolia to Madagascar to China. But probably the best place to start is at the beginning because you grew up in the Welsh Hills, didn't you? That's it, yeah. North, North Wales here. Uh, yeah. The coast, so Old Colwyn. Nice place, you know, quiet place, not not so exciting, not a lot of stuff happening, but you know, you've got the sea, you've got the mountains, it's a, it's a good place, especially for the outdoors, you know, yeah. Snowden, which I'm sure many of your listen, listeners will know, it's probably about 30 to 40 minute drive from where I'm based, um, so yeah, it's a good place to be. Uh, well, I mean, it must have been absolutely incredible growing up in that sort of area and, you know, having the space to sort of roam. Where did this sort of love of adventure sort of come from? It's a good one. It's a good one. Um, I think it's probably just being surrounded by nature um, growing up, but it took a weird turn because in school I was very much the sporty type, not necessarily adventure. So I wouldn't be necessarily camping. I'd be, you know, on the school football team or doing athletics or, or boxing or, you know, I was very active. I was very competitive. Um, but then, you know, I'd see photos or like magazines or the internet, of, like different places around the world. I would, I would hear epic stories of, you know, how people would test themselves through extreme environments and, you know, sort of what they would achieve, um, being deemed impossible. I would hear stories from, you know, one of my old uncles was, was South African and he told me some crazy stories, um, what went on in, in Zimbabwe. Um, also my granddad lived in Pakistan for a good 21 years, overstayed his visa by many years, uh, and now lives in India. And I think there's probably a little bit of everything, even documentaries, you know, David Attenborough shows on, on TV and I just didn't want to watch it. I wanted to be out there amongst it all. Um, and so I guess sort of my competitive and active side sort of met the sort of curious and wanted to go travel side, uh, which led on to me doing these expeditions. Um, but I, I finished college. I did a two year outdoor course, um, a two year course in outdoor education. And it was probably then that I realized I was more of a kinesthetic learner, you know, sort of learning from hands on practical experience. And I wanted to pursue a more active career, active lifestyle where I could learn through getting myself far out there, you know, learning through my mistakes, effectively, uh, through experience, getting up, trying again, uh, and never trying to make the same mistake twice. 
So where? So what was the first one? What was the first one where you uh, decided, right, this is it. This is where I'm going. How did it all start? It was. It was when me and my friend Matt we had worked. I don't know how many hours. Two hundred and forty hours a month as lifeguards for a good year and a half, solid. We're very strict with our cash, uh, minimized nights out. I sold my cheap little car for a little bicycle cycling to and from work. We then eventually set off, um, going to China first. We were in China for two weeks. We then left China for Southeast Asia. And I remember uh, being in Cambodia, you know, me and my friend Sulkin on the Mekong Riverbank, we'd spent way more money than we anticipated. You know, we were 19, so we were just teenagers effectively. And I said, you know, this is all great traveling around, but we're very much on the beaten track, you know, same photos, stories, experiences as all of the rest of the tourists, which was great. You know, we uh, met people from all over the world, but it's not what we went traveling for. You know, we wanted our own unique experiences and an adventure. You know, we didn't want to be traveling overland on a coach. We wanted to, you know, hike or cycle or, you, and meet the locals, not go to the typical tourist sort of lunch breaks that the coaches would take you. Um, and so, you know, I decided let's get a bicycle um, and let's cycle the entire length of Vietnam and Cambodia, you know, 1,100 plus miles. We were on a very tight budget. So we had £10 to spend on a bike each. We spent about £2.50 each on a non-waterproof tent. We didn't get no pump, no puncture repair kit. There was no helmet. There were, the bike had no gears, no suspension. We had no electronics. We had no map. It was reckless, you know, but we were, again, low budget. It was sort of foolhardy, but it was that Vietnam cycle that was the catalyst. We were chased by dogs. We were hit by mopeds. We were dodged by lor lorries and trucks. You know, the bikes broke over 17 times in total. They just couldn't hack the mountains. These were bikes made for short distance for pretty much old ladies going to and from work. They weren't made to cycle such a distance, you know, but we really hammered it on those bikes and they paid the price. And, but we made it, we made it after two and a half weeks. And I was like, that was insane. I found my passion and my love for adventure and I wanted to continue doing it. So I would say that that was the catalyst for sure. Were you happy that you sort of skimmed on the pump and the tires and everything? Yeah, I, you know what? I was because it taught us some great lessons, um, but it also brought us closer to the locals. I remember one time we cycled through the night sometimes. Um, you know, the last day we cycled 39 hours continuously all the way through the day, through the night, through the following day, over 45 hours with no sleep. You know, I posted a photo on my Instagram actually the other day where my face is just you know, bags under my eyes, my skin's a mess. It's actually blue because the mosquito spray mixed with the sunscreen. Uh, we were on a bad diet of just noodles because that was super cheap. Um, and, you know, the times that we got punctures, for example, and we didn't have a puncture pack or pump, we would literally rock up on like the local sort of community or hut that's on the side of the road. And, you know, these, they never really sleep. They always, always seem to be awake. And they would welcome us in, you know? And so we would get inside, they would feed us up, give us some tea as the guy would like uh, very kindly sort the bicycle. Um, we would offer him a um, small bit of cash, but he wasn't interested. He just kind of said, enjoy your cycle. And we cracked on. So it was really great to, to be pulled inside for an hour or two or how long, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, I remember that being as well. Um, and getting closer with the locals. We were in such remote places. I remember the locals coming over, uh, sitting around us whilst me and Matt were eating our noodles and they were pulling our leg hairs. Uh, you know, we were tired, you know, frustrated. We were hungry. And these locals are coming around and, they're, you know, they're pulling, pulling our hairs, and especially on our legs. And we noticed that the Vietnamese men don't have hairs on their legs. Uh, and so they were quite fascinated with these sort of blonde hair. They're bleached now in the sun. Just little interactions like that were, were great. And if it wasn't for the pump and bunker of bacon, we might have missed many of those interactions. So it's interesting. I, I think when you go off the sort of beaten track, those sort of things happen. People are sort of shocked to see you. And it, it creates such an amazing experience because I remember when I was sort of going, not quite the same, but through America and again, went very skimpy on certain aspects like uh, this... Uh, what was it? The bicycle uh, seat, which 
turned out to be a big, big mistake. If you're cycling long distances, get a good seat. Um, you certainly pay the price in pain. <laughs> and uh, I just remember in like sort of these sort of tiny, tiny towns, when I'd sort of rock up, they'd always be like, well, why are you here? How did you get here? I mean, it's the most mental thing. <laughs> Great. And that's what it's about, isn't it? I love that. I love the human interaction and, you know, the curiosity of getting out there and meeting new people. It's, uh, that's probably first and foremost, what really pushed me to do these adventures was, you know, meeting the, meeting the locals and just experiencing that country for what it is rather than what the lonely planet says it is. For example, you know, we were against that. We didn't take those lonely planet books. <laughs> we were just like, no, let's make our own. If we, if we rock up and we choose a bad restaurant to eat, so be it, we'll pay the price. And we did many times. Um, but we didn't want to follow the typical, you know, but the Lonely Planet recommends this place. So we should go there where we meet lots of other tourists. We were just sort of, you know, and it's helpful now. I've changed, you know, I've matured a lot more. I'm not that stupid when it comes to um, decent recommendations. And I get if you're on a gap year for, or, or even if you're traveling for a month, you want to visit the best. You want, don't want to spend your time there, go into the, the poxy places. You know, you want to you want to get the best, and so the Lonely Planet's good for that. But at that point in time, we were just against it, and you know, just just doing our own thing as we went. And so, I suppose that was the sort of catalyst, as you said, for your big trip to Mongolia. Not necessarily to Mongolia. Oh, just uh, okay. So it was sort of more more adventures. Sort of Mongolia, yet. Yeah. Um, and if I had attempted Mongolia age 19 with the bad planet of Vietnam, I would have easily died. I would say it was the catalyst to actually seeking adventure fully. You know, after the, the Vietnam cycle, we crossed into Thailand. We were then north of Thailand in a place called Pai, and we crossed illegally into the, uh, across the border into Myanmar via the jungle this 2010. Um, and, you know, we were invited by a local to teach us sort of jungle survival. And if we can walk a good number of days, we'll arrive at a Burmese hill tribe community uh, and they'll teach us how to survive as well. And it was sort of like berries that act as mosquito repellent. They would teach us how to hunt, how to gather, how to build sort of rafts and shelter using natural resources. Another amazing experience. And that led on to then um, going to Australia and taking on adventures. We were cycling the south of Australia. We were hitchhiking the north after a breakdown. I was fruit picking, trying to build up the cash. Um, and then Australia was just too expensive. So we moved back to Asia. We just missed it. We were then trekking the Himalayas with no permit, just sort of avoiding any Pakistan military that we may come across on the border there. Um, and then money started to run low, but we had a plan in Wales before we left for traveling. Uh, which was to gain our scuba diving qualification so that we can top up the funds as we travel. And it was now time to act on that plan. We had already worked in Wales to get ourselves to a certain level within scuba diving. We just need to finish off the courses in Thailand. And then, yeah, for the next two years, I was, I was living out in Thailand as a scuba diving instructor, a Muay Thai fighter. I loved it. You know, I, I probably should have been fully satisfied, but it was during those two years that the Vietnam cycle, the, the Himalayan trek, the survival of the Burmese hill tribe, they were just constantly playing on my mind. And I was really hungry for adventure. I was only 21, 22. And I was like, you know, I'm not done yet. I'm still young. There's still lots to be done, lots to be seen. And, you know, lots of new ways to, to push myself to see what I'm capable of, but also to you know, go to countries that I'm completely unfamiliar with to mix and mingle with more locals, you know? So it was sort of all of this that was playing on my mind. And and it's at that point, Mongolia came to mind, you know, I was sort of looking through the map, looking for some harsh country that is extreme and that I'm completely unfamiliar with. Um, and I'd been on the travel route now for two years, teaching tourists sort of how to scuba dive, ticket off the bucket list. It was a great lifestyle. I loved it, but I hadn't come across any, any tourists. And I, I met thousands at this point that had said that they'd been or plan on going to Mongolia. And so I'd hear all of the other places that they would go. There seems to be this typical sort of route that people, you know, favor, um, to travel. 
but Mongolia hadn't hadn't popped up and I was just curious and it was home to the Altai Mountains to the, the Gobi Desert you know second or third most sparsely populated country in the world you've got the eagle hunters in the west it's a it's a wild wild place and my brain was ticking I was like imagine doing a 100 mile trek instead of a cycle because when there's a cycle great fun proper adventure but if you're cycling you're on predominantly on a road and where there's road there's people where there's people there's food there's water so you're always relatively safe and so I wanted to do a walk to get me off that even off the roads you know I was I was wanting to sort of rely solely on myself to survive whatever terrains and weather systems I was I was coming across and, and Mongolia struck me as one of those harsh countries where I would need to rely solely on myself only coming across locals every week, every other week. Um, and so, but it quickly jumped up from maybe a 100 mile trek in Mongolia to maybe south to north until I decided let's walk the entire length. Um, no one wanted to join me. My friend was like, yes, that this, you're on your own. It's too dangerous. And it turned into a solo and unsupported trek. Um, I didn't know it was a world first. I, you know, I wasn't interested. Uh, in the world record, I just wanted to do it because it was proper adventure, you know. And when I started to research and gather up as much sort of information and local knowledge as possible, and realised I couldn't find anyone who had done it, I started to expand on the teams and brought more teams involved to actively search for me as well. And we came across this guy who claims to be the first person ever to attempt a solo and unsupported trek, but was evacuated on all three occasions. I think it was just before or just after the halfway point. You know, this guy was a Navy soldier, a desert explorer. He had already crossed the Sahara Desert. You know, he was he was a tough guy, um, fully experienced as well. I think he was late 30s or, or early 40s. And I was a scuba diver living on an island with no military background. And I was kind of like, I don't stand a chance. Um, and so I put Mongolia to the side. I started looking up, you know, more populated countries, safer places to trek or to at least build up my experience. But then I realized, you know, just because no one's found a way to do it, which he hadn't, doesn't mean it can't be done. And so I start to really, you know, grind with the training, grind with the logistics. I knew it needed proper preparation, unlike the Vietnam cycle. Um, I only had 200 pounds to my name. I had to move back to North Wales. I moved in with my parents. I didn't even have no um, finance for gym membership. I had my uncle drop me off a tractor tire, you know, I had a sledgehammer. So all of the training I did for that world first was in my back garden, just in the winter, you know, building myself physically and mentally, I'd say it's 70% mindset, 30% physical. Um, I was shit scared. I was terrified of everything. I didn't know what it would be like being alone. I didn't know. I'd never faced a pack of wolves before. I'd never been to a desert before. I didn't know if I, I didn't know my mentality. I, I, I didn't know if I was the type to quit, you know, everything else that I had previously done. I, you know, deprived myself of certain things like dehydration, sleep deprivation. I starved myself on previous adventures. I'd done reckless, dangerous ones, but they'd always been with a friend uh, and they'd never really pushed me to the, to my physical limits and my mental limits. And so I was just unsure at the tender age of 22, I was just unsure if I had what it took and that scared me because I started to build hype around it. Uh, you know, I'd have nightmares of me just quitting uh, one week in, like, fuck this. This is not for me. This is terrifying. I can hear a pack of wolves howling, you know, and, and, and getting out of there and quitting. And then, you know, having come back home, people pat me on the back. Oh, you tried your best. You know, I did not want that. I was terrified of that too. And uh, so, yeah, I'd say that's what sort of led me into, into Mongolia. Wow. And so I imagine when you were dropped off in Mongolia, start of the trip, knowing that you've got all those miles to cover on your own for how many days, like 70, two months, three months? Yeah, it was, um, yeah, 78 day trek. Anticipated to take a hundred days. Um, but there was just lots of daylight hours, you know, 16 hours of daylight. So I, I tried to make the most of that and managed to do it in 78 days. Oh, wow. And so what was the feeling like when you were at the start looking ahead? You must have just been like, oh, my word. The Marine in the back of your mind being like he nearly had to be evacuated three times. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was shit scared. <laughs> But I tried telling myself that I was ready. I was, you know, I was trying to hype myself up as much as I could. You know, I'm the guy to do it and what I'm going to do in this situation or that scenario. But the truth is, I just never knew how I would react to any situations that I was about to face because you never know until it's staring you in the face. Um, and I remember when I was here in Wales, I remember being scared of the whole idea of Mongolia, but I was sat just in the living room, sort of a cup of tea, belly full of food, shelter, warm, very positive. And I remember this side to me, I'm going to lose when I'm out in the Gobi Desert or the Altai Mountains facing a snow blizzard or whatever. You know, I'm not going to be this positive. Yeah, I've got this. And so I actually left a voice note in my, in my phone, a voice memo of sort of positive me talking to negative me out in the Gobi. And I told myself that I would, I would definitely not listen to that voice memo unless I really needed to. Um, <clears throat> and I did really need to at one point and I pressed play and I was sort of, it's me giving myself a stern talking to about the pros and cons. Um, what happens if I make it compared to what happens if I don't make it, you know, career wise, future wise. Um, and so I, you know, got myself to this, start point i just about managed to scrape in enough finance to make it happen it was still low, low budget my insurance was invalid because they don't support any solo journeys in in mongolia um because it's just so wild and i was in the altai mountains in a place called olgi it's already about three three and a half thousand meters high and i'm there with this 18 stone trailer 120 kilograms 260 pounds you know the same weight as probably Tyson Fury, you know, a, a world heavyweight boxer in, in the back of the trailer there that I was about to lug for almost a hundred days over the Altai Mountains across the Gobi Desert in 40 plus degrees Celsius and through the Mongolian steppe. So I was, I was daunted man, beyond belief, but um, I was excited to get going. You know, I told myself, break it down day by day. Don't look at the 78 day magnitude. Just look at, look at the, the days that I've got, um, break it down. Um, and yeah, I, I, I went for it. For people listening, they probably, it's hard to imagine what the sort of landscape is like. Can you sort of describe what it's like being out in the middle of the Gobi Desert alone with no one in a sort of hundred mile radius of you? Yeah. So the Gobi was, it was a tough one, the Gobi Desert. I remember finishing the Altai Mountains and I, I'd taken a beating you know, I was at altitude. Um, I was told by the locals, I'm going to be eaten alive by the wolves all in hand gestures. Cause we couldn't actually communicate. Uh, my lips had blistered up completely. They were like bleeding and sort of the scabs were sticking together. So I'd had to ply them open each morning and just like drinking my ration pack in the morning. And like when I would put the pouch back down, there would be a flow of pus and blood, uh, into my rations. So I, I was, you know, I was very windswept. I was very cold. I, I'd taken a beating. I was probably slightly dehydrated and I had lost a lot of weight pulling the trailer over the mountains. And, you know, I got to the Gobi Desert for the first time and it doesn't happen straight away. It's, qu it's quite gradual breaking from the mountains into the desert. It's like a process of a week walking wise. And I remember being excited by the warmth because I'd faced, you know, the cold temperatures of the Altai, but Whilst it was warm, I just got a pasting from sandstorm after sandstorm for a solid week and a half or so. And all the sand would just get in my chapped lips, you know, and I was just in a, in a lot of pain. But then it did eventually subside, you know, the weather and it, you know, it became calm. And, you know, little did I realize that that's actually even more dangerous. I'd be facing, you know, a much bigger threat, not only to the expedition, but to my life. And, so if you can imagine the scenes, uh, Mongolia is known as the land of eternal blue sky. So the, the sky is just pure blue, dark blue. And for many weeks, there was just not a cloud in sight. The sun was just beating down 16 hours a day, you know, 40 plus degrees Celsius. Um, the terrain is a mix of soft sand and gravel. So the gravel was always welcoming because of the, the trailer, it was on wheels, thin wheels, and I was able to pull uh, the trailer over the gravel, um, you know, with not, what, with not great difficulty, but when it came to the soft sand, the, the tires would sink in the soft sand and I'd have to lean 90 degrees forward and, you know, really 
use both my legs and my arms using the walking poles to to pull the trailer through. Um, but it's rugged. You see nothing. I think I went over eight days without seeing a, a single human. You know, um, it was still, I came to a point where it was so silent. And, you know, I remember my logistics manager mentioning to me before I set off for this journey, because I, I said to him, you know, can you imagine how silent it's going to be in the Gobi? There's going to be no noise pollution, no nothing. And he said, well, when you're at that point, you'll realize that there's no such thing as silence. And I sort of laughed. And I was like, what do you mean? They've got panic rooms. They've got like silent rooms and stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it was a torture back in the day. And he was like, well, when you get to that point, you'll know what I mean. I was like, okay, he didn't actually tell me, but I did get to that point. And I got to the point where there was no insects, there was no noise, there was no shifting sands, because normally in the sand dunes, you can, you know, hear sh the sand shifting. Uh, no wind, no humans, no noise pollution, nothing. And I could hear this faint sort of deep humming noise. Um, and I assumed it's something coming from my trailer, maybe my water container. So I left my trailer behind, walked, you know, a few hundred meters away and I could still hear it. There was nothing on me. I remember holding my breath and everything. It took me about 15 minutes to figure it out. Um, and it, I clicked, you know, it was at that point, it was so silent that I could actually hear my own body functioning. And that's what he meant by there's no such thing as silence, because as long as you're still functioning and you're still alive, you will always hear your body ticking over, but you just never hear it because there's always some sort of noise, whether it's the, you know, the plumbing, the electric wires or, you know, the wind or insects or rustling somewhere. Uh, I never heard it before that. I've never heard it since, even on my future expeditions. And, you know, so that sort of puts into context of sort of what the Gobi Desert was like, vast, empty, quiet, apart from this, the occasional sandstorms. It was um, a very wild, very remote, hostile place to be. Wow, God, that just sounds absolutely amazing. Like actually hearing your own body function. Is that something you'd be like, oh, do I want to go back and feel it again? Or was it just like, that's the weirdest experience, never again? I can't, I hope I do experience it again in the future, for sure, whether it's the Gobi Desert or not. And I do remember I was trying not to panic through all of this, you know, if we're not seeing humans for so many days, bearing in mind, I was still covering a lot of mileage, 20 to 30 miles a day and still not seeing uh, people in eight days. But I remember thinking, you know, don't panic. This is very rare that you can travel this far in a country and not see a human. So I remember thinking I maybe seem a little bit daunting, or a little bit freaky to me right now, but, you know, I might not ever experience this again. So enjoy it whilst it lasts. Did you have a sat phone or anything to communicate to the outside world or in the Gobi Desert, were you 100% alone, unable to communicate? Uh, yeah, so with the, I had like an inReach, so it's a satellite phone. It's a text only sort of tracking device, if you like, because I needed to uh, track the whole journey and it sends off a ping every five minutes, 24 seven for the 78 days. So it marks my whole route like it checks your speed, it checks your altitude, um, coordinates, you name it. And yeah, and so it was text only. So I, because it was all so low budget, I think I could only send a max of three, three texts, no more than three texts per day, um, which some days I wouldn't need to send any text. What that included to social media as well. So there was no phone call um, and my evacuation plan the previous guy, I think he had a rush. He made a joke because I asked him about evacuation. I was like, you know, what do I need to do? And he was like, marry a Russian. Um, because by marrying a Russian, uh, or because his wife was Russian, I think he had certain access to the military and was able to get evacuated that way. Um, whereas with myself, it would be text only to my logistics manager based in the capital city. If I'm in the middle of the Gobi Desert, it would take him at least three to four days to get to me if he got to me, you know, on time and found me okay. Uh, and if I was to stand on the back end of a snake, for example, three to four days is just too long. <laughs> so I was very much out there alone, completely solo and unsupported. Um, and my pickup, or sort of my evacuation plan was, was potentially a four day evacuation plan, uh, which, you know, three days without water and you're dead. And so that was my biggest concern and that's what scared me most. Sort of being alone for that long, I remember hearing a story of Ed Stafford who, 
you know, walk the Amazon River for two and a half years. But he said the worst was actually when he was marooned on an island for 30 days without human contact or human communication. He said that was far worse because when he was walking the, walking the Amazon, he had someone there to talk, even if they could barely communicate and he was seeing people. What does that, being alone with no communication for so long, sort of do to your mental state? I think it will, it will all depend on that individual, I would say. Like a lot of people will cope a lot better of being completely alone than others. Others will freak out spending, you know, two hours without their phone, for example, you know. And in the Gobi, I, I, you know, it was, it wasn't, how long was it alone for? For it must have been eight, nine days. And then other than that, I was in the desert for five weeks, uh, walking through the desert, but with, it wasn't five weeks of not coming across anyone. You know, I would come across locals temporarily every now and then. Um, so maybe that did something, just seeing, seeing people. Um, otherwise, I felt like I was, I, I remember counting the days. I remember breaking it down and the map helps, you know, I've only got this many days until I reach the Mongolian steppe, for example, which would be sort of more lush green grass. There'll be more vegetation. There'll be more wildlife, more locals, more water. And so I think I just kept that as my main goal. And as long as you stay focused and realize that this isn't forever, it's only for five weeks or four weeks or three weeks or whatever you're working towards. And that's what I did. I just kept breaking the goals down and saying at nighttime, tomorrow is another day. Um, and then come morning time, I was like, right, tomorrow, uh, to, uh, at the end of today, I'm going to be closer to my main goal than I, than I am right now. Um, and so I think it was just breaking down the goals, staying focused, not losing your head too much, not panicking um, and, and getting by day by day. Otherwise, I, th I think, yeah, if you think if you're in the Gobi Desert within the first day or two, your lips are all chapped, you're being battered by sand blizzards, you're already dehydrated and then you realize you've got five weeks of this. It's going to get to you psychologically. It will break you down. Um, and it did break me down in many ways, but I just stayed disciplined and, and, and stuck it out day by day. And it was all those days that added up to the big five weeks of, of making it out of the Gobi Desert. Wow. So I would like to think I, st I was, I was on form, you know, and, and, and stayed focused and realized it wasn't, it wasn't here forever, but I did almost lose my life. I almost came close to dying out in the Gobi, which was, which was terrifying as well. Uh, how so? Um, so I came across an unconfirmed, so we marked on the map confirmed and unconfirmed water sources. And that was mainly in the form of a well. However, some of these wells might be locked. Um, they might be dry. They might be stagnant. And I came across an uncon unconfirmed water source. Um, and it, there was no, there was no water. And you would always plan whereby you've got enough water to last past the unconfirmed water source and to the confirmed water source. But you're in the desert, you're hot, you need fluids. And so I had gone through a lot of my water, arrived at that unconfirmed water source, realized I had a long way to get to the next confirmed water source, sort of rationing my last remaining dribbles of water. I was a little bit like, oh shit. I was already in a bad way. I was already delirious. I was already hallucinating. Um, you know, severely dehydrated, very quickly coming into heat exhaustion, which is usually fatal. And at my worst, I remember thinking I have four days and the four days stands out the most because four days, I kind of missed the point of backup. I didn't believe I could survive five or six days. And if my logistics manager came to me, say, if he gets to, to gets to me within four days, and it will take him another day or two to get me, you know, to shelter, to get me out of the heat of the Gobi Desert. And I just couldn't see myself surviving that many days. You know, people, if they get heat exhaustion, they can die within a day. I'm sure you watched, um, it was at the Nile with Lev Ward, his photographer. 24 hours, I think he was dead from heat exhaustion. You know, it can take you. And there's been many stories like that where it happens fast. And so I was terrified with that prospect. Um, and I remember being out in the Gobi, you know, hallucinating, incomplete agony, almost feeling my organs drying up. 
hiding under my trailer because that was the only shelter I could find for a good hour at a time and sort of realizing that if I don't keep getting up from out of the trailer and pushing on, I'm going to, I'm going to die. If I keep resting for too long under the trailer as well. Uh, and if I rest under the trailer and rely on my logistics manager to get me in time, and if he doesn't, so all of the odds stacked to me getting up and walking out in order to survive. And I remember I couldn't visualize four days, four days was agonizing. Um, but what I did was again, something that I use all the time is I, I broke my goals down. I, I focused on hundred meters that I could see in front of me, uh, and, and no more than five minutes under the trailer. And so after five minutes, I'd get up, I'd strap the, the trailer to me, you know, dragged out through the soft sand. It felt like 500 kilograms, um, covered a hundred meters, 200 meters if I was lucky and then rest for another five minutes. And this went on for four days rationing. I had this big 20 liter water container and I kind of had about this much at the bottom, maybe an inch or two stuck to the bottom. And I needed to make that last me, um, the four days. And so I still had fluids, but nowhere near enough. Um, and you know, when I eventually got to the community, yeah, pretty much collapsed. Um, it was a community. It was confirmed. There was water. They took me inside and it took me about eight days to recover before I could um, pick myself up and, and crack on, you know, not just physically, but mentally too. The, the, you know, the, the desert had scarred me. I was scared of the sun and how quick that can take you. I believe I got very lucky, you know, four extra days in that heat. I, it's, I don't know how I survived. It was maybe a little bit of lady luck was on my side. I like to put it down to the trainer in the preparation, but you know, maybe, uh, um, and yeah, I made it, but I bucked up the, the courage again and was able to push on through finishing off the Gobi Desert and then the last remaining three weeks of the Mongolian step to finish the journey. Wow. And God, that must have, how did it sort of feel at the end? Amazing. You know, I loved the last week of the trek uh, where it was the realization that all of the toughest is now behind me. Now is just I'm in the, uh, in the Mongolian steppe. It's cooler temperatures. There's a lot of storms happening, scary storms because it was full climbing and I was pulling a, tr a metal trailer behind me, you know, but, um, cooler, a lot of water. I just remember just thinking, yes, I passed that. It was that section that I guess the, the previous guy was evacuated on. Um, and I was just happy that I was able to push on. And maybe if I had good evacuation, maybe I would have pressed that button. Who knows? Maybe if I didn't weigh up the odds and realize that my only option is to walk in order to survive, um, maybe I would have, you know, pressed the SOS and got and got picked up if it was there within a day, you know, who knows? And so I kind of think I, I almost needed that, needed the lack of funds to have such crap insurance. <laughs> and such a bad evacuation plan in order to achieve that expedition perhaps um and i was now walking this last week and i just yeah had this big smile on my face and crossed that finish line i was just a, a happy guy and you know i couldn't believe it uh it had been achieved couldn't believe I'd, I'd completed it and that was my first major sort of world first record yeah that's an interesting sort of point to sort of say is you you had such bad contingency plans that the idea of something going wrong meant that you really were on your own whereas I, th I imagine if you had a little tracking beaker and they said oh we'll be there in six hours you could have very easily that temptation to be like I'm really suffering here this is terrible but to know that you have four days so it's a, almost a matter of life and death for this you just had to keep pushing forward yeah yeah, I almost had that option taken away from me. Um, and, the, and the enormous bill that would probably come your way. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> I definitely couldn't afford it at that time. <laughs> well, that probably got you uh, in pretty good stead for your sort of latest expedition that you've just done, Mission Yatsi. Yes. Um, can you tell us a bit about that and how that all came to come about? Yeah. So, you know, after Mongolia, I was, I'm always planning ahead, um, you know, one step ahead. Whilst I was on the Mongolia journey, I was planning Madagascar. 
Uh, and before I set out for Madagascar, that was my second world record. Um, I was already looking at two expeditions on completion of Madagascar. And what this would do, it would motivate me to complete the expedition. Madagascar was a tougher journey, again, on Mongolia with just 155 days. I don't think one of those days was a pleasant day's walk. It was just challenge after, uh, after challenge. Um, and so planning the next expedition almost motivated me to get the job done in Madagascar. And I was planning too. I was looking at the Congo River and I was looking at the Yangtze River. Um, and now I had to look at it in a smarter way. Uh, to you know look what makes sense business wise finance wise and for me china made most sense um and so i i yeah i took two years this was very difficult planning i needed to make many connections on the ground in china um i needed to be ambassador for certain organizations i needed to have the government stamp and sign certain documents i needed to have authorities um covering my back or at least on my side, um, in order to get through such sensitivities. And they even needed to make me a temporary doctor for a year. It, it got insane. It got ridiculous. I think along the journey, I was carrying well over 13 stamped and signed documents, legal documents from governments, officials, authorities out, out there, let alone the logistical you know, nightmare of actually planning a journey, which most of the locals were saying, you can't do this or what, what, when you get to this section, how are you going to navigate that or the V-shaped valleys, you know, what are you going to do? The bears, the wolves, the blitz, you name it, you name it. And it took two years, but this was my third world record. It was my most ambitious. It was a 4,000 mile journey, um, taking 352 days, so pretty much a year to complete walking from the true and scientific source of the Yangtze River at over 5,000 meters altitude of the Tibetan Plateau to then following it across east, south, um, southeast, northeast, and then fully east to Shanghai, where the Yangtze River pours out into the East China Sea. And so at the beginning, you know, it's just a small trickle high up at altitude that you can step over. And by the end, as it pours into the East China Sea, it's almost 10 miles wide. And you've got multiple cruise liners um, sailing along the Yangtze. It feeds almost half a billion people, uh, goes through major cities along the way. Um, we were filming for a National Geographic documentary called Walking the Yangtze. We made it, well, we tried to make it one of the most interactive world firsts where we literally shared blogs, vlogs, live updates, photos, and videos. Uh, and then we even opened it up for people to join. We had Chinese celebrities, organizations, brands, members of public, and it was just a very special journey. Um, I, I loved it. And of course, there were environmental angles, as there is with every expedition. There was with Mongolia, was with uh, Madagascar, and with this Yangtze one, we pointed up with the WWF, uh, raising awareness for single plastics, um, uh, single use plastics, sorry, environmental protection, sustainability, doing free talks at schools along the way, handing out filtration bottles, um, and, and working with the real unsung heroes, doing their utmost to protect and preserve the unique biodiversity of of all, all these three countries, really, China, Madagascar, and Mongolia. Uh, but yeah, special journey, special journey for sure. God, so how did that all start? Because Tibet's are quite a uh, sort of, what's the word, um, contentious area, especially in the sort of Chinese region going down. Did you have much trouble with that? Yeah, constant, constant trouble with that. I was pulled in by the police about five times. Um, one officer pulled me over into Tibet, into the government officers and questioned, um, questioned me. They were threatening to deport me. Um, and I knew, I anticipated all of this. I knew that this was a huge possibility, um, you know, and, and would happen. And that is what the whole two year planning was all about. You know, it was to make sure it was all legit or legal but also to make sure that I have such good backing that the authorities in Tibet would have no choice but to drop me off exactly where they picked me up. Um, if it wasn't for the documents and preparation, they would have just got rid of me. Easy work for them. Um, and it's so strict. They don't care. You know, even if I offered a certain amount of money, 
You know, they've um, they've wiped Brad Pitt's visa off him. They have declined Orlando Bloom. They've cancelled all Katy Perry's sort of um, concerts across China because she was wearing a dress that um, is, is, I think, the logo on the dress um, represented a certain sign that was against their religion. So, boom, just like that, pow, they don't care how big you are, how much money you have, they all buy the books. And, and I had a solid team, well, many teams out in China, and they were shortly, you know, telling me this, and we worked hard, and, and you know, when they took me across to Tibet and were threatening to deport me, it was just a call to the government. They would speak with the with the guys in Qinghai province, and and they had no choice but to drop me off. So, that, so they, they hated that. They were like, God damn it. But um, it was great, great pr- preparation, unlike, you know, some of the rest, which were very reckless, logistically, very dangerous. This one, I feel I had got down to a T. You know, I was even able to take out satellite communications, which is heavily illegal. Um, but again, with the right permission, I would, I was able to, I was able to, to take that. And that's why we were able to make it so interactive online. Otherwise there's no way I could have been posted, especially not to Instagram when it's banned in China. Um, so there were, a lot, <laughs> there were a lot of sensitivities for sure. Got to a point where we even had to avoid the locals. It went from mission Yangtze to mission escape and evade. We realized we were in such a sense of area that we needed to escape and we needed to walk fast and get out of there because we were inching high. But the problem was there's, you know, the China map says it's Qinghai. The Tibet map says I'm in Tibet. And so um, it was very sensitive and we had to evade the locals because we learned that the locals in their little white felt tents, their girls, as amazing as they were and super hospitable. And I loved my time with them. We, we came to learn that we have to do our utmost to avoid them because they would sort of radio to the next girl, to the next girl, until eventually there was signal that they could call the police and the police would be on their way. It'd take them seven hours or so to get to us and they wouldn't rock upon our tent until three, four o'clock in the morning. You just see the sort of headlights on your tent and you're out in the wild and you're like, oh shit, here we go again. Um, an absolute nightmare. Um, I had the guides threatening to leave because of the police. Um, yeah, we had a lot of issues and it was only, it only really stopped when we then got into Sichuan province. Um, you've got Qinghai province for the first sort of three to five weeks and then you've got Sichuan and the Yangtze River is a clear border that goes directly south of China. Um, and it separates Sichuan from Tibet. So as long as you remain on the east side of the river, you, you're absolutely not in Tibet and we could stop worrying. We still had many police encounters, but we could stop worrying about being deported. Oh my word, that just sounds unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, and that's minus the bears, the wolves, the minus 20 degrees Celsius, the snow blizzards. It, it was a lot, it was a lot. I think even before we got to the source of the Yangtze River, it took us two attempts to get there and I was already four members down. My guide got altitude sickness and three of my film crew, one of them was just shit scared of the bears and just abandoned the trip completely. Um, one of them got altitude sickness and the other one was just hit by the harsh reality of this isn't fun. This is, this is hard work. And he just left. And so already, you know, we, we didn't even get to day one. We're talking 352 days. And before we reach day number one, I'm already 40 members down. I'm having to take my guide off the mountains because he's got altitude sickness, regroup in a nearby city. I say nearby, it's like a whole day or so away. Um, but regroup with a new team and, and try again to finally get to the source of the Yangtze River. Well, how high is the source of the Yangtze River? Source is just over 5,100 meters. So okay. It's pretty similar, ever, uh, uh, similar base camp. Uh, yeah, altitude to Everest base camp. Yeah. Oh wow! So God, you you had uh, enough trouble just before they even started your expedition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know, for even four months in, I'd lost ten of the sixteen different people that joined me at different times. Ten had to be evacuated or just straight up abandoned. The wolves, the you know, fear of wildlife landslides at a UK photographer who flew out to join me for three weeks and he had to leave after six hours and day number one because it was a landslide that just you know he wasn't comfortable navigating over um which was fair enough you know he's a photographer that's not his expertise but that taught me a lot of lessons as well like 
you know, I kept opening it up. Like, yeah, come and join me. It'll be a wild, good adventure. But, you know, a lot of people's mindset and the training, they specialize in different things. And sometimes I forget that I've been doing this for a decade now. You know, I kind of think, oh, yeah, anyone can do it. You know, come and join. It'll be great fun. Um, and I almost forget what I've learned or it's been so gradual that I've not really felt like I've learned anything, even though I have. And so when you're faced by, you know, you stalked by a pack of wolves, when you've got a pack of wolves on your tail, or when you've got like a landslide and yeah, one wrong foot foothold and you, you're gone. Uh, you know, it's kind of for me in that adversity, I deal with it a lot better and I'm just like, that's fine. I just, I just won't fall. You know, I feel capable and confident with my abilities. But then when there's someone out there who doesn't really do this stuff and they're faced with a, with a landslide and they don't know if they can navigate over it because they haven't done this before, he, he, you know, he made the right choice. And I gave him the options because you can't, it's not a game. It's not like football or whatever. You can't motivate your team to, you know, come on, we can do this because one wrong slip, they're dead. That, that falls down to you uh, for trying to motivate them to do something that they clearly couldn't do. So I gave them the two options. We can either navigate it this way or that way. I said, you know, forget ego, forget pride. It doesn't belong out here. You know, I need you to be honest and tell me if you can or can't uh, manage that and, and make the right decision. And he looked in, um, and yeah, he, he was honest and like, yeah, no, I don't think I can. And so we, you know, sent him home. He had a family back at home, but the risks weren't worth it for him. Yeah, I, th I think uh, a lot of people sort of, they sort of have, what's the word, glamorous ideas sometimes of what these expeditions can be like and they sort of imagine it sort of quite heavily with rose-tinted glasses, let's say, and suddenly the realities of most of it's just trudging for 16, 18 hours a day, again and again, seeing some amazing things, but it is just hard graph again, day after day, day after day. Yeah. Yeah, toenails falling off, blisters, rubs from the rucksack. You know, you're not eating that day. You've got to come to terms. You're not eating that day. You've got water. You don't know where you're sleeping. You know, you want to try to find some fencing because they're all bears actively on the hunt because it's torpor season. It's minus 20, so you're going to have to try to set up and dismantle your tent with the guide, taking it in turn. You've got to, like, literally one minute at a time. I'll go do work on the tent, and then I'll have to escape literally <laughs> start warming my hands up whilst my guy's then working on it. And then my, and he's Tibetan, he's a hard guy. And he lasts one minute before he's then heating up his hands and I'm then giving it a crack. And, you know, you've got all of this and the niggles and the worries and the doubts and the unexpected things that happen along the way or people letting you down straight up saying, I'm going. And you're like, wow, okay, so I'm back solo again. So sometimes, you know, I think 70% of that I was alone. Um, and I think a lot of people joined me you know, and kind of was seeing my Instagram and being like, wow, that's a cool video, beautiful shots. And, you know, I think they were just stung by the harsh reality of, of actually this isn't as pleasant as it looks on, on the ground. <laughs> and we're kind of like, I'm off. Good luck. I think that's always the case. It, it shows, the, you know, the beautiful pictures, the beautiful mountains, but very rarely shows the, the sort of effort that's gone into getting up to that point. Yeah. And I'm bad at that as well. You know, I remember being effectively told off by my speaking agent during Madagascar because I'm talking about malaria um, that I had right before I was held up at gunpoint by the military. And as I'm talking about all of this and the shit that's gone wrong, I'm doing it like with a smile on my face. I'm talking about like, and he's like, no one gets it. You're smiling and you're laughing. Like people think it's a doddle, like it's a walk in the park. You know, can you not like fake cry or something? I'm like, no, no, because that's the positive mindset that you need to, to complete these expeditions in the first place. You've got to smile, otherwise you will cry. You know, you've got to laugh. Um, and so to try to portray how difficult the Yangtze was, I guess, I guess there's lots of people out there who will be able to do it very well. And I think there's a lot of people out there who will also exaggerate. And I don't want to do, I don't want to dramatize. I don't want to exaggerate. Um, and you know, I want to, I'm, I'm more of a positive guy. I want to show the positives. So if I, if there's a beautiful sunset, I prefer to show a photo of a beautiful sunset rather than all of my toenails hanging off my toes, even though 
that photo of my toenails hanging off my toes would show the real light of what the expedition is about, you know, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll start sharing some dark times of the expeditions in the future. Did you come into sort of contact with the bears and wolves? Because I imagine people listening might sort of think, my God, um, you know, if you're stalked by bears or wolves, I mean, how was that? I mean, it sounds horrific because if, if some, most of quite a lot of your crew are bailing left, right and center, it sounds like probably what you've just said, it it sounded like, oh yeah, they were just there, but actually it probably was quite, um, hairy. Oh yeah, no, it, it was, um, it was never, um, you know, before my two film crew went, this is about three days before we made it to the source of the Yangtze. We were camping in this remote location um, and we saw a local and the local came right over to a campsite and he said, I saw a bear right where you're camping this morning. So it's little stuff like that. I think the locals played a part in it um, in really terrifying. And you could see the footprints. You could tell that bears had been there that morning and we were about to camp there that night. You know, it was pretty freaky, but kind of, I knew in our big numbers, you know, we had a horse with us. There was now three of us. We'll be okay. Um, but, but still, you know, it was cold. It was about minus 10 degree that de- degree Celsius that night, pretty chilly. Um, and they woke up the next morning and, and that was it. You know, they were just like, we're not ready for this. It's too cold. You know, we've not even been trekking yet and we're already being warned about the bears and, and they went and I kind of, I kind of started the journey with a healthy mindset of the bears are going to leave me alone if I leave them alone. You know, they don't want anything to do with me. But the locals kept telling us and showing us otherwise. And I, I do always believe there is no better knowledge than local knowledge. And I do listen to them. They live there. They face these struggles on a daily basis. Um, and I would try to ignore, but they said, you know, and I didn't have any weaponry. I had an air horn and a whistle. Um, and you know, you're supposed to blow the whistle so that the bears know that you're coming so they can make themselves scarce. Cause I don't, they never really want to attack you for food. What will happen is you'll rock up on them by accident. They weren't aware that you were coming. You didn't, you know, you get to the top of the hill, bam, there's a bear. It freaks out. It's going to attack you because it's panicking self-defense almost. However, there's a particular season called torpor season, which is effectively like hibernation. And that's the season you don't want to be up at the mountains at. But due to the two and a half month delay that I had, I was up in the mountains during the torpor season. (laughs) And so the locals were like, this is, this is stupid. What are you doing? You're here at the wrong time. And I was like, I know, I know that, but you know, this is the only time before the winter closes and then it drops to minus 40 degrees Celsius. So I'm trying to get off the mountains as fast as I could. And they were showing me photos of bear attacks, people that had been mauled by bears. They were showing me videos um, of bears coming into communities and killing families, chasing people up trucks. I posted one on my Instagram as well, actually. Um, And so once you see this, and one of the locals that we were with said that he had to lock himself in his, and this wasn't a good, this was an actual concrete hut and he had a steel door. And this uh, Tibetan brown bear walked straight past this Tibetan mastiff and was scratching at his steel door for an hour. And I'm like, I'm in a tent. So what it is, they're coming off the mountains because it's too cold for them and they're looking for those extra calories before they go into hibernation. So that's the season you want to avoid because they're actively on the search for food. And so all of this was happening and we were seeing bear footprints and, you know, we were gifted knives by the locals saying that there's been an attack in the village, you know, two days hike from, from here. And, you know, each night that I'm in my tent, I'm bricking it, you know, making sure I've got no food near my tent, making sure I'm eating away from my tent. Um, and that plays a huge part. You're not doing anything to a bear. You're not doing anything. Um, and that's all I kept thinking of. If that rocks upon my tent, what am I going to do to a big hungry brown bear? Um, and then you've got the wolves as well. And the wolves didn't phase me as much. They're not like the Mongolian gray wolves, you know, the wolves in Mongolia, they're big. Um, these aren't that well sized, but they do roam in packs. And it's funny because we actually filmed this and we got it. It, it's, it aired on the Nat Geo documentary. 
but we could we filmed these Tibetan guys trying to warn us of something, trying to tell us, but we didn't really know what they were saying. Um, but anyway, we just kind of said, yeah, thank you, bye-bye, and we carried on walking. And for the next two days, we were followed by a pack of wolves. They were only ever really on one side of the mountain following us for the two days. They usually, you know, cover a lot more distance than us, and they were certainly scouting us out, looking for any injuries, looking if we're limping, um, and looking for a right time to approach us closely. And anyway, they disappeared after two days, no biggie, we cracked on. And, you know, that footage that we filmed at the local was sent back to my Beijing team, my production team. Um, and one of the girls going through the footage speaks Tibetan and she called us up. Well, she called me up and said, you know, you had no idea what you were saying. I was like, no, clearly not. She was like, well, he said down that valley there, only yesterday, a local lady was killed by a pack of wolves, avoid going down there. And we were there, oh, okay, thank you, you know, bye-bye. We carried on walking down that valley. Um, and that's what he was trying to warn us. So whether it was the same pack that killed that lady or not, I'm not sure. Um, but I would have thought so. And that's quite eerie. And I'm kind of glad I didn't know at that time. And so the wolves weren't as big of an issue because I think there were definitely ways that we could scare them off. But saying that, if there was a local that had recently been eating, um, then, you know, you, you just never know. God, that just sounds absolutely horrific. And so that, that trip took just just under, just over a year? Just under, yeah. 352 just... days in total. Uh, it wasn't 352 days of solid walking, though. Um, you know, there were times in communities where I really wanted to soak up their way, their way of life. I didn't want to make it just about walking every day and, you know, it wasn't a speed record. It was a world first. So I wanted to gain as much no local knowledge and I wanted to film and, and capture them because I wanted the documentary to be not about one man and his mission. I wanted it to be about the um, protection of the environment, the, the locals, their way of life, their views, their opinions, their sort of local delicacies. And I think we, we done a great job of portraying that even the older generation and their sort of old traditions dying out and what they think of the younger generation and modern day technology and whatnot and, and vice versa. So I would stop off at cities along the way too. And, try to do as much as I could and meet as many people as I could. And, and so, yeah, and we were doing presentations and I was working with the WWF. And it was a great journey and it was like split up into two. The first six months I closed off. I, I, I stopped people, people from joining. It was just too dangerous. So it was very wild. It was very survival based, but it was, you know, wonderful with lots of locals sort of living their way of life high up in the mountains and then the second six months almost felt like a different expedition. It was now hotter. There was more vegetation. There were major cities I was coming across. We were able to open it up. So it was like really interactive, um, which was which was great part of that journey. What was the sort of, out of that sort of year, what was the one thing walking across, walk, basically walking across China, did you learn, did you feel? What was the one thing you sort of took away from it? How big, vast and diverse the country is it felt like I walked through multiple different countries. You know, we're talking up on the Tibetan plateau. It was minus 20. It was high mountain peaks, snowy conditions, bears and wolves. But then down south of China, still on the Yangtze River, it's really tropical. It's like you're in Thailand. You've got, you've traded your bears and wolves for your snakes and spiders. You've got your plant uh, plantations, your vegetation. You've got your spicy food now, not your high carborific sort of nomad diet. Um, and then, you know, you keep walking again and you've got more urban life, city life. And it's just always forever tra changing. Even the dialects, I, you know, I was learning a little bit of Mandarin, but it was almost no, no help at all because the dialects kept changing almost every week be a new dialect um, which was insane and so I would say yeah it was just how incredible the locals are how misunderstood China is um, how wild it is when you think of China you think of the big cities but for a good six months I was in the wilderness um, it is a very wild wild place um, and you know they're doing a lot the news doesn't talk about it but they're doing a lot they're the biggest polluter of course you know, but they, they're doing a lot to combat that. They've done a plastic bag ban. They've banned fishing from the Yangtze River. 
they're throwing up um, solar panels and wind farms at a huge rate. Um, they sent like 19,000 soldiers out um, to plant trees. You know, they're rapidly sort of um, fighting climate change as well. So I learned a lot along the way. And yeah, I love it. I love it as a place I could, you know, I, I hope to do more, more adventures because although I've done 4,000 miles, there's, there's still so much. It's a big country. <laughs> Wow, it just sounds absolutely incredible. And as you say, you went through such incredible, diverse landscapes and culture along the way. It just sounds like, as I say, quite quite the adventure. Yeah, yeah, man, it was wild. It was, uh, yeah, so good. So good, loved it. And I suppose, I, I imagine people are listening, but you, you've put yourself in quite a lot of difficult situations and you you sort of have the perseverance to sort of push through till the end where a lot of people sort of give up. What do you think it is in the back of your head that always keeps you going? I think it's multiple things that keep me going. Um, I think it's, you know, one of them is that that I visualize the whole sort of route. Uh, You know, I'm a big believer in visualization. Um, But when I talk about visualizing, what a lot of people do is they'll visualize the positives, they'll visualize the end, which is great, you know, it's still still important. But what I'll try to do is visualize the bad shit that's going to happen, you know, visualize all the worst case scenarios. And so that when they do occur, it doesn't come by surprise or by shock. So it doesn't lead me into panic. It leads me to believe that I expected it. So just, just tackle it. And so I may be able to tackle challenges a little bit better with the fact that I, I pre-visualize them, if you like. I think it's that. I think another one is sort of I shout about it. I tell the world what I'm going to do. And the last thing that I want to do is fail at it, come back home and have people, oh, you know, tap me on the shoulder. You tried your best, matey. Don't, don't want that. Um, and the third is I believe each and every challenge does – you learn from that. You learn so much about yourself. Um, and whether that's, you know, a, a team expedition in Madagascar where I had a guide and I, I'm learning more about myself, you know, working as a team and how to be a better leader or whether that's completely solo and how to sort of manage my mood and how to manage decision making and how to motivate myself. I learned so much on these trips that even the hardships where I'm where I ask myself, what on earth am I doing? I know that if I continue, I'm going to learn so much about how I continued, why I continued, and the rewards will be much greater. Rather than asking myself, what am I doing? Let's just stop. And then quitting and then coming home thinking, I would still be out there, you know, an extra 200 miles further than where I was. So I think it's multiple different things. And I know that people are going through and fighting through much worse uh, and so that's always inspiring to know that, you know, there's much, much great things have been achieved, much, m- many more people doing far more difficult things. And so um, that plays a part in the mindset too. Yeah, I think, I think that's very true. Very true. Well, Ash, it's been absolutely incredible hearing your stories and great job. I, there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. So the first is, what's the one gadget that you always take with you? I would say it's the water to go filtration bottle. Um, so it's this bottle. So effectively on the mission Yangtze by carrying this one bottle that's got a built-in filter, gets rid of like 99.9% of all contaminants and bacteria. Um, by using that one bottle, that stopped me from using almost 1,500 half liter single use plastic bottles. So it's good for the environment. And it also stops you from using the chlorine tablets, but also you don't need to boil the water as well. And so you can literally just scoop up any water. I think I have drunk in full. I have drunk through a, like a puddle on a dirt track that vehicles go down. So a mud puddle scooped it up, you know, I scooped up the little rocks and mud as well. And I was able to filter out the water that I needed during that time. Um, and so that's one thing that I'm always taking with me. Wow. Yeah. It's very useful. That little thing. <laughs> mm. What about your favorite adventure or travel book? I'm not a big reader. You know, I'm not a big reader. I don't, I wouldn't say I have one. 
but I would say my favorite book or two of them is Sapiens and the, the secret law of attraction. I have heard that book. Uh, who's it by? I forgot who it's by. Um, it was years ago that I read it and I just loved it. And I'm like, yes, that's the one. So Homo sapiens and yeah, the secret. Okay. The secret law of attraction or the secret. The secret is the main title. And then the subtitle is, is the law of attraction. Okay. Ah, I'll check that one out. Uh, why, why are adventures important to you? I think for me, it's, you're kind of feeding your curiosity and curiosity covers absolutely everything. Every human is curious to some extent. Um, and for me, getting out, exploring the world, you know, in this one life that we have, meeting different people. I learn from so many people along the way. It's like, as I said, I didn't have no military background in order to learn how to survive. Um, and I'm no expert by all means in survival, but the, but I have survived on my journeys and that's probably thanks to the people and the locals that I've met that have shared their knowledge with me. And so I've learned a lot about the world, a lot about people that I, that I meet along the way, a lot about my, a lot about myself that I also bring back, you know, to civilization, to the corporate world, you know, the whole breaking goals down the whole, we can't always be motivated, but we can be disciplined and the whole realization that we are so much more capable than we give ourselves credit for. Um, so for me, adventure is everything. And I really do get everything from, from adventure. Yeah, it's very true. It just, it just brings so much more to life. Yeah. Uh, what about your favorite quote or motivational quote? I would say it is the biggest danger in life is not doing what you want to do now in the bet that you can buy yourself the freedom to do it later. I think that one is, and a lot of people do it. A lot of people sort of, I can do that later or I'll work hard now, save up the finance. And when I retire, I'll travel the world. You know, you're never guaranteed tomorrow. And even if you are, your whole mindset's changed. Like if I was to leave traveling for the first time now at age 30, instead of when I was age 19, there's certain things that I just wouldn't be asked about now, you know, um, crossing borders illegally wouldn't you know i wouldn't be doing that now it'd be too reckless uh go and venturing into a jungle with a madman with a machete and a bandana around his head i would be thinking well that sounds suicidal but when i was 19 i did it and that you know i was able to get so much from that and so you know when you're if you retire let's say age 50 55 you're not going to be asked about doing the world highest bungee jump you know your whole mindset will change that's why i do say yeah i I love that saying the biggest danger in life is not doing what you want to do now in the bet that you can buy yourself the freedom to do it later yeah i think that was a really interesting ted talk and the guy speaking was talking about how it was basically along the lines of that quote and he sort of said you know when we were younger our dad wanted to retire at 55 and used to get up before we got up and be home late and we'd always be like yeah go dad go dad and then he had a heart attack when he was like two years away from retiring and and as you say i think that quote sort of rings so true to so many people Mm. yeah um people listening are always keen to travel and go on these sort of grand adventures for themselves what's the one thing you would recommend for people wanting to get started I would say, um, I would say don't over plan and don't over complicate. I think the biggest sort of failing to people planning and organizing travel is they bombard themselves with too much info with too many things that they think they need. Um, when the, the most important thing is just taking the first step. Um, like now with my expeditions, there's an awful lot of planning because it is a matter of life and death. But when I look towards towards my earlier trips, you know, for example, me and Matt Salkin on the Mekong Riverbank, when we made the decision to cycle Vietnam, we were cycling the next day. We had no kit. Then within a day, we went to having the kit and, and cycling, no map, no puncture repair kit, as I mentioned, nothing. And I think that's the way to do it because that changed everything. If then we really started to plan it, like, oh, okay, where can we buy a pump? Or where can we get this? Or, you know, let's go to some sort of library and purchase a map. And, you know, it would have delayed time. And by delaying it, 
our mindset would have changed and we would have come up with thought of a different idea or we would have just been like, oh, this is too much to do. I thought it'd be fun, but now it's not fun. So let's not do it. And so I, I my biggest uh, recommendation is just, just do it. Don't hold back. Don't over plan. Just get it done. Amazing. Finally, what are you doing now and how can people follow you in the future? Sure. Yeah. So I am still planning. I still see this as just the beginning. Mission Yangtze was the warm up. Uh, <laughs> um, but we are, we're working on more projects, we're working with TV, the team's sort of expanding. So it's very exciting times right now. Um, still training. And, uh, yeah, if you want to find out more or interested in, in following, I am on the Instagram, which is just Ash Dykes as the website, Twitter, YouTube, you name it. And, uh, yeah, I hope to announce what's next soon. Uh, so we have to wait, do we? <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately for now <laughs> <laughs> well Ash it's been an absolute pleasure listening to your stories and, and great great questions they were John appreciate that and no worries and I cannot thank you enough for coming on today really 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 interesting <laughs> well take it easy yeah appreciate that mate all the best well that is it for today thank you so much for listening and I hope you got something out of it if you did hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already And I will see you in the next video.